All right. Well, thank you again for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Krista McIntyre. I will be your uh, moderator for tonight's webinar. Um, we're very excited to have a couple of our very experienced and knowledgeable clinicians joining us uh, tonight for this session. And we're going to be talking all about what you need to know about BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Neither of those things are easy to say, and I will try my best to not screw up the BPPV uh, throughout the evening. Um, but I want to take a, a few moments just to go over a few housekeeping things to begin with. I do wanna let everyone know that we are recording tonight's session uh, and we will be posting a recording as well as a summary of the webinar on our website, lifemark.ca. Uh, it will be posted in the blog section of our website and you all, all of you as um, registrants of the session will receive an email with a link directly to it as well as soon as, as, soon as it is posted. Uh, we also would like to encourage everyone to use the Q&A option to ask any questions that you may want to ask of our presenters tonight. Uh, it just allows us to be a little bit uh, more easily keeping an eye on themes and content. Um, the chat gets a little bit busy when we have a lot of people on. So if you can use the question and answer feature, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I do want to let you know that uh, because of the nature of uh, this being a medical condition, uh, we cannot provide individualized advice. Um, so if you do type a scenario or your own particular problem into the Q&A, we will not be able to answer that. However, we will be looking for any themes to the questions that are being posted and try to bring those into more of a global question that we can ask of our presenters as we go through the night. As I said in the chat before we got started, um, this is not a typical Zoom room uh, where everyone can turn their cameras on and unmute. Uh, it is a webinar, so it's structured slightly differently. So you as participants uh, are not able to turn your video on uh, or in, in, turn on your audio. We do encourage you to type in, again, using the question and answer uh, feature within Zoom uh, so that we can see any questions that might be relevant to you. So I think that that is all of my uh, housekeeping items. I want to take a moment to first introduce all of you to our lovely uh, presenters for this evening. I'm gonna stop my screen share for a moment, our, our, our panelists. Uh, so first I'm going to uh, invite uh, Marina to say hello to all of you. Marina, if you just wanna say hi. Hi. <laughs> Awesome, just because it then puts you on the screen. Uh, Marina is a registered physiotherapist. She works in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan at Lifemark 8th Street. Marina graduated with a Master's of Physical Therapy from the University of Saskatchewan. She has completed extensive postgraduate training in vestibular rehabilitation and concussion management, including a certificate of vestibular re rehabilitation from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And Emory really is the gold standard uh, certification program in the North America for this area of practice. She's passionate about working to improve the quality of life of individuals with balance and vestibular disorders and those experiencing dizziness. So thank you so much, Marina, for giving of your evening tonight to share your expertise with everyone. Thanks. I would also like to uh, let Manny say hello. Manny, can you say hello from the wonderful mountains of British Columbia? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Great. Uh, Manny is also a registered physiotherapist. As I said, he is in Kelowna, BC, uh, working at the Lifemark West Kelowna site. Uh, Manny completed his Master's of Physical Therapy from Western University in London, Ontario. His passion is learning, um, his passion for learning has facilitated the continued development of his skill set in vestibular rehab. Manny has also achieved his FCAMP uh, designation after obtaining a diploma in Advanced Integrated Musculoskeletal Physiotherapy. Um, he is also trained with some of the leaders in concussion and mild traumatic brain injury in Canada and has a particular interest in working with those patients. So again, thank you so much, uh, Manny, for joining us tonight and for sharing your knowledge as well with all of us. Thanks. Right. So I'm going to get us kicked off with a couple of key questions I think are probably burning on most everyone's mind. Uh, so first off, I'm going to go to you, Manny, and I'm going to ask you... Um, what, what do we really mean by vertigo? Like, I know that there's lots of people out there who go to their doctor and quite commonly they will be diagnosed with, quote, vertigo. What does that mean? What does that diagnosis really tell anyone or tell you as a, as a vestibular therapist? 
Yeah, that's that's a really good question, really good place to start. So um, I think it's important to first understand what vertigo actually means, like you said, right? So vertigo is the sensation of movement around you, whether that's you moving in your environment or the world moving around you. Um, so oftentimes people will describe this as a spinning sensation, right? Um, that's what vertigo truly is. So it's a symptom, right? It's not necessarily a diagnosis. Um, to put this into kind of a more relatable example, um, imagine you go to see your primary care provider for pain in your knee and you leave with a diagnosis of knee pain, right? That's not necessarily the diagnosis. That's what you're experiencing, right? So that's what being diagnosed with vertigo truly is. It's just saying you're having this spinning sensation. Um, and there are a number of things, number of diagnoses, actual diagnoses that can actually cause vertigo. The topic of today's discussion, BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is one of the most common causes for this vertigo sensation. Unfortunately, because BPPV is such a common cause of vertigo, um, a lot of people also get incorrectly diagnosed with BPPV for their vertigo, right? So truly vertigo is a symptom versus BPPV is an actual diagnosis that can cause that. That's great, Manny, and thanks for taking a minute to kind of, I think, clarify that for all of us, because I think it is a really important distinction to make. So before we get into the things that it isn't, maybe Marina, can you tell us what really is BPPV? Yeah, you bet. Well, it's important to note that in addition to hearing, our inner ear is also a part of our vestibular system. And so they basically can act as a motion or position sensor. So I think we actually have an image of the anatomy of the ear that we might be able to pull up here. Perfect. Yeah, so if you look at the top portion of the screen there, that's just an image of the ear. You know, you see the outer ear, which is what most of us think of as the ear. Um, but, you know, as we move further inside, we got the ear canal, the middle ear, and then further inside our skull is that is the inner ear. So kind of like that snail-like portion is the hearing center, and next to it is the, the vestibular apparatus. So inside of there, we have a whole bunch of these teeny tiny uh, microscopic uh, calcium carbonate crystals, which we call otoconia. So if you look down at the, the bottom right of your screen there, you can see those little white kind of pebble like uh, things those are the crystals and they sit on top of a gel and they're part of a mechanism that um you know, helps us to detect when there's some kind of tilt or uh, whether there's that linear acceleration, deceleration, you know, changes in speed of our head. Um, but also there's another part of our inner ear. If you look at the bottom left portion of the screen, we have these three semicircular canals. And so it's important to note too, we have an inner ear on our left and our right side and they're working together. Um, but in the in, in this here, we have these three semicircular canals, which are essentially like a fluid filled tube. Okay. And so when we're, they help to detect, you know, angular rotational kind of movements of our head. And when they, when we perform those movements, that fluid swishes within the, the tubes. And there's another part, um, there's a kind of that blue looking kind of dome like projection that's blown up. That's a, a cupula. And it has some little hairs that kind of detect when that fluid's moving that kind of communicates that movement to the brain. So in part, those, those two areas work together to let our, known, let our brain know what our head is doing. So with BPPV, what happens is that those um, small crystals um, can actually slough out of the chamber where they're supposed to be, and they can fall into one or more of those um, fluid-filled tubes. And then what happens is that when we go to actually move our head, gravity pulls on those crystals, um, makes them move within that, flu that fluid-filled tube, which sends a signal to our brain saying our head is moving when it's not. And that can uh, produce you know, a brief spinning sensation or that vertigo that Manny was uh, referring referring to. So I believe we have an animation that we're going to show we can show as well. So let's just orient ourselves first before we press play on the actual uh, screen here. So you can see there's kind of that brown squiggly area that there's two of them. That's where those crystals are supposed to be. And in this image, you can see the small white dots and those are going to be uh, representing the crystals. So in this image, they're already displaced. They've sloughed out of the area where they normally should be housed. And so this is where how your ear is sitting if you're upright. Um, but what happens is they're going to move as we'll see shortly when we press plate. Um, when the woman goes to lay down, let's take a look. So when she goes to lay back here, the inner ear is going to move. And as you can see, those um, uh, crystals fall into that fluid filled canal. And then when she goes to sit back up, they move again, but they're now kind of stuck. Okay, so um, we might play that one more time just so you can see that again. So again, they're sitting, they're already displaced. 
um, when she goes to lay down, they move. And while they're moving, they're going to get to that lowest line level. They stop there because gravity is, you know, no longer pulling on them. She gets back upright and then they the top deposit there again. So when that um, when those crystals are moving again, that fluid's moving and that's indicating um, that the head is, is moving. So what normally happens um, when we are moving our head, there's also an association where um, our brain makes our eyes move too. So in this situation, um, what's happening is that the, 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 the ear in which the crystals are, are moving within, it's saying to your brain that your head is moving. The normal ear, which it doesn't have them in there, is saying you're not moving. And so that mismatch of information produces a really strong you know, error message. And so in that situation, um, you're going to feel dizzy. And the reason you feel dizzy is that the, you know, your brain's making your eyes move um, because it thinks your head moving, which would normally be appropriate, but since you're not, it's giving that spinning um, sensation. So we're gonna take a, a look here at another video um, of a woman who does have BPPV. And so we're gonna, in this in the video, lay her back into to a test position and you'll see that her eyes are gonna move. Um, Cause again, those crystals are telling her brain that she's still moving even though she stopped. So let's take a look. So she's laying her back in that Dix Hall peg position. And as you can see, her eyes are just bouncing there, moving quite rapidly. Um, and during this, this eye movement, she would be feeling that vertigo um, spinning type sensation. And just because it's nice and short, and I think it's kind of interesting, but I'm a nerd. <laughs> so let's try playing it one more time. So you can see it again, that eye, quick, rapid eye movements happening here. Now, in this particular example, hers is very strong, very pronounced. So her eyes are, are, are moving and beating quite intensely. So we can see them in room light, but that's not always the case. Um, a lot of folks, when they are experiencing it, it's, it's a lot milder. Um, so we can't always see it in room light, which is where it's important for us to make use of, you know, um, technology that's at our disposal. Um, you know, so we use something called an infrared uh, goggles. Um, so we have these blackout goggles. So when we put them on, you're in the dark and there's a camera that allows us to look at your eye when it's in the dark. And uh, we can probably talk about that more a little bit later if a question comes up about how they work and what they do. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Uh, thanks, Marina, for sharing with us some of those pictures and, uh, you know, really seeing that lady's eyes jump around. You can kind of really see, oh, well, certainly that might make you feel not very well. So exactly. that's great. <laughs> yeah. So, meaning I'm going to go back to you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the anatomy. We've seen these different kind of parts. Marina's explained to us a little bit kind of what it is, but what causes this problem? What causes BPPV? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question too. And one that we get very often in the clinic. And that's the first thing people want to know, right? Um, so to understand this, I think we need to take a look, a closer look at those otoconia, these famous crystals, right, that we have in our ears. So these crystals, like Marina said, they are normally meant to sit in a specific compartment in your ear. And they kind of cluster together. Um, over this gel kind of layer, right? Um, these crystals normally, as you can see here, kind of at the top, um, top left, those crystals are normally meant to be clustered together, but our bodies are constantly kind of shedding these crystals, they dissolve, and then we replace them with new crystals. Um, what presumably happens in BPPV is that these crystals start to actually break down into kind of these smaller little pieces. You can kind of see it in the bottom left. You can see it in that D picture that, um, yep, right there. Um, and presumably what this allows for is now for these little broken pieces to actually go and move into the canals, right? And that's when we experience the vertigo and we get BPPV. Now, what causes these things to break down? So one of the things that can do this is just increasing age, right? Um, which is why we tend to see this more often in an older population. Um, it's also not uncommon for us to see this um, after a head injury. So like a car, um, if a patient is in a car accident or if a patient um, has a concussion, for example. And then there are other risk factors that can increase um, your chance of developing this. So for example, um, we know that women are more likely to get it than men. If you have a vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis, migraine, higher total cholesterol, these are all things that can increase your likelihood of developing this condition. Um, what we tend to see most often, though, is that people don't have a head injury or anything like that. They come in and they say, I went to bed, and the next day I sat up in bed and I experienced the spinning, right? 
great. Thank you for that, Manny. Yeah, and that those pictures really kind of help to, it, you got to remember that those are really zoomed in too. So these crystals are uber, uber small. Um, and so the, the zoom in to kind of make that uh, visible to all of us is really, really helpful. Um, so Marina, I'm going to go back to you and I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about what symptoms someone might suspect they have BPV. So what might, if we talked about vertigo, vertigo is one of the key things, but what are the things that are going to happen to an individual that would kind of maybe make them think, huh, this might be what I've got? Yeah, good question. I mean, as, as Manny already said, the, you know, the definition of vertigo is that illusion of motion taking place when it's not actually happening. And so that is one of the you know, key hallmark things that you're going to experience is that, you know, gen generally it's described as a rotational spinning type sensation, but it's important to, and that could either be you spinning or things spinning around you, um, but it's going to be brief in nature. So, you know, sometimes it's only just a few seconds, sometimes it could be a minute or so, but it's not going to be going on for, you know, hours or days on end. That's not BPPV. That's really Really important to note that. Um, but the other real key thing is that it's only brought on by head movements. Okay. Um, and so if you're not moving your head um, and getting dizzy, that's not it. So, but the, the kind of, as what Manny had said, sometimes you wake up with it. So that's one of the big things is you, you get out of bed, you feel you get the spins and you know, I wasn't drinking or anything like that. Right. But you get that spinning sensation or you go to lay down in bed or roll over in bed, either onto your right or your left side. Um, a lot, another really common one is looking up. And so frequently lots of patients will say, I went to the dentist and I was tipped back in that chair and holy dino is I ever spinning around or, you know, go to the hairdresser to get your hair washed, um, you know, or maybe you're bending down to pick something up, um, or even just quick head movements, whatever plane that might be, um, could produce um, some of that, that dizziness or, or vertigo type sensation. Now, other things other than that, that vertigo sensation that you might experience if you have BPPV, um, could be nausea. Unfortunately, lots of folks feel quite nauseated when they are experiencing this vertigo and sometimes even to the point of vomiting, not everyone will do that, um, but some do. Um, oftentimes people will complain of feeling quite unsteady or just off balance, um, you know, kind of throughout the day or, you know, in between bouts of uh, this vertigo uh, as well. Um, sweating is a big one um, or even just an elevated heart rate. And so the reason that these are happening is your, your body is identifying and your brain saying something's really not right here. Something's going on. And it's almost like a stress response that you're, you know, experiencing uh, when you do have these, uh, you know, intermittent bouts of, of vertigo. Now, some people who have BPPV may feel 100% normal in between these, you know, bouts of, of spins, um, whereas others might have that sense of, you know, mild dizziness or imbalance in between um, and just generally feeling off. So both are, are, are characteristic of BPV, but the big thing again is it's, it's brief, that spinning sensation, and it's brought on by um, a particular head movement. Yeah, if I, if I can add to that, um, I think it's important to note that um, just because you don't experience that like wicked vertigo, that wicked spinning sensation, that you don't have BPPV, right? Um, some people, if they're moving slowly to begin with, or um, sometimes their body will just kind of unconsciously slow down when you have this condition to try not to kind of trigger those wicked episodes of vertigo. Or you may even do it because you know certain positions or certain speeds of movement are gonna trigger it. If you're avoiding these things, you might only experience a little bit of like a mild dizziness, right? Um, you're not gonna get, or I mean, sometimes people feel um, not just mild dizziness, but also a sense of like unsteadiness, right? Just feeling off kilter. You're not gonna get that wicked vertigo or that wicked spinning um, that, that you might expect if, 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 if you know about this condition. So don't think you don't have BPPV because you're not getting this wicked spinning sensation. Yeah, and, and dizziness is something that's uh, quite hard to describe at times too. And so that's where um, sometimes I'll, feel, I'll find people say, I get a whoosh or I got a little bit of like a different word. So it's not always like a pure spin, right? So you kind of, it's, it's something challenging to describe, but you know something's not right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, definitely. That's great. The whoosh. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You can think of kind of all different ways that you might describe that sensation. So yeah, thanks for highlighting uh, all of those various different things that definitely are. So Manny, I'm going to kind of go to you and I wonder if there are any certain symptoms that would suggest that it's not BPPV. So, so we've heard a lot about different things that it should, that it could be, but are there any signs or symptoms that would tell us, no, it's not BPPV and it may be something else? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So like Marina said, 
um, position, like position is BPPV. So one of the P's in BPPV stands for positional, right? So the vertigo should come on with position changes. It should be brief if you stay in that position or it should stop when you get out of that position. Now, there are certain types of vertigo that, um, or sorry, BPPV, I should say, that um, can cause prolonged symptoms. For example, if the crystals are stuck in a, uh, along those hair cells in the canal, you might get longer symptoms, but it should always stop when you're out of that position, right? So think position for, for BPPV. If it's not coming on with position changes, right? If it's just coming on at rest for no reason without any sort of head movement, that's a sign that you're probably not dealing with BPPV, right? Um, Furthermore, if you're, for example, getting um, any sort of numbness, any sort of pins and needles, uh, if you're getting any sort of um, hearing changes, if you're getting flashes across your vision, black spots in your vision, double vision, um, all those things are not common and don't fit with BPPV and that, that might indicate that something else is going on. Um, now, some people will describe feeling like they're seeing like, you know, that 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 aggressive spinning can cause like blurred vision or something like that. But it should never cause those flashes. It should never cause those black spots. It should never cause that constant double vision. So if it's not happening with position, that that, that word being key and you're getting some of these other things, then you're probably not dealing with BBPV. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And like I said, a couple, couple great tips there. And like I said, some things that are atypical, um, but certainly um, a, a knowledgeable therapist could also help to um, sort that out for a patient or an individual as well. So Marina, um, how do you actually like test or how do you know whether someone actually has BPV? So we've talked a lot about what it is and how it's caused, but like, how do you actually figure this out? Yeah, so I mean, as we mentioned earlier, um, when the crystals move, it makes your eyes move. And so what we know is that we have really distinct patterns of eye movements, which we call nystagmus when we have BPPV. And so those are, you know, really consistent. Uh, one of the ones that we saw was, you know, in that initial video of that woman when we laid her back. Um, that that was, you know, causing um, her eyes to kind of move upward really quickly and beat accordingly. Um, and so in her situation, we could see it in room light, but lots of times we cannot when it's more, you know, more subtle or not quite, it's a milder version. So in this uh, situation, um, that's again where we use those infrared uh, goggles um, in the camera. And so again, as I showed you previously, we're going to place these over your eyes and in doing so, you will be in the dark. And so when we do that, it, it allows it so that you don't have anything to look at anymore you can't um, sometimes when we're in light we can suppress some of these eye movements but when we're in the dark we cannot um, and so uh, or at least makes it easier for us to pick up on these subtle movements and the other major benefit of using these two is that um, we can look at your eye on a very large computer screen so it's enlarged so we can really see the, the intricacies of how the eye is moving and another major another perk of it too is we're not right smack close to your face when we're looking at your eye um, so it's more comfortable for the person experiencing as well for us not being right in front of your face. So um, let's, we have another video, I believe, that we can queue up here um, where Sheila's going to demonstrate another test. And you can see um, there's going to be an overlay of the video of uh, what we would be looking at through the infrared goggles. Um, so it's going to be kind of a black and white image. Uh, and that's what we'll see. So let's just take a peek at that. What we would do when we're assessing for this is we would help you into a number of different test positions that would change the position of your inner ear such that if you do have some crystals in the wrong place, gravity is going to move them a little bit. Okay? So it'll reproduce a bit of that dizziness that you're experiencing and while that's happening, we're going to be having a really close look at what your eyes are doing. Yeah, so as you can see here too, the eyes are just beating kind of side to side um, quite rapidly. And so again, that's indicative of those crystals moving. And so um, the, the really fascinating thing when we are watching um, uh, these, you know, watching someone's eyes and we're able to pick up on these movements or this nystagmus is that um, 
we can actually determine based on how your eye is moving and the duration of these eye movements um, where the crystals are located, like where these culprits are hiding out that they're you know, causing so much mischief. And so um, it allows us to figure out which of the two ears, which of the three canals in that particular ear, as well as we can determine um, whether it is that free floating crystals or whether they are the hung up variant. And that in turn allows us to figure out what maneuver or treatment techniques we need to implement to help uh, you know, fix things, and help you feel better. Great. Marina, did you want to play that again or you feel like everybody had a chance? Yeah, I think it, I think it would be good maybe to take another peek at it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat to see that. What we would do yeah, when I'm we're either. assessing for this is we would help you into a number of different test positions that would change the position of your inner ear such that if you do have some crystals in the wrong place, gravity is going to move them a little bit. Okay? So it'll reproduce a bit of that dizziness that you're experiencing. And while that's happening, we're going to be having a really close look at what your eyes are doing. Yeah, so again, you can see the eyes are beating quite rapidly side to side, and it's changing directions when we're removing the head from one side to the next. So I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Not so cool when you're the person who is dizzy. However, it's pretty neat to watch because it is something that we can, you know, really uh, accurately figure out what's going on and, and help a person out. So. Well, and the, the value of those goggles, they said, you know, that would be quite, oh. quite difficult to see, you know, in most people's and in most scenarios, but having that be, like you said, projected into a larger screen where you could see it with a lot greater detail, um, that would be really helpful. So thanks for that. So Manny, uh, Marina told us like how you test for it and what you're looking for. How do you actually treat this? How do you, how do you address this BPVD? Yeah, so the first thing to treating it is you need to figure out which ear it's in. You need to figure out which canal it's in because you have three different canals in each ear. And you have to figure out what type of variant you have, right? Are the crystals free to move around in your ear or are they stuck somewhere and they need to be kind of dislodged first before you could actually treat it properly. Um, once you figure all that out, then we have a number of maneuvers um, that we can that we take you through to try and essentially reposition those crystals back into that chamber where they're supposed to be. Um, so essentially, we do a series of head of head movements. We use gravity to kind of help the crystals move based on our knowledge um, of what's going on, and then we try to get them back to where they're supposed to be. So I actually think Sheila has another video for us um, that kind of explains this a little bit more. The treatment involves taking your head slowly through a series of different angles to use good old gravity to just reposition those crystals back into the chamber where they're supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. She makes them sound a lot more simple than it is. Um, yeah, so essentially, I always imagine those little maze games that we all got in our loop bags when we were kids and we went to a birthday party um, with the bead kind of in the middle of that maze and you had to move that maze around to try and get the crystals back into the or try and get that little bead into the correct compartment right that's exactly what we're doing here right what with our, with um, through our assessment once we figure out what's going on, we pick the correct maneuver. And then we try and correct the position of those crystals. Um, importantly, I think it's important to note that the, this maneuver is actually quite effective, right? A lot of people can get complete resolution of their BPPV with one, sometimes two, three um, maneuvers or treatment sessions, um, and they no longer have to experience that dizziness or that nausea or that vertigo. Um, However, you do need to make sure you know where exactly those crystals are and which year, which canal, et cetera. Um, in the other variant that we've kind of talked about a little bit where the crystals are kind of stuck in the canal along those hair cells, um, sometimes that can be a little bit more stubborn to treat, but even then we have maneuvers to try and quickly kind of dislodge those crystals, get them free floating, and then we can use another maneuver to again, try and put them back into the correct chamber in the inner ear. I know um, sometimes, unfortunately, I have seen people, though, who have been given, you know, these outdated treatment regimens of things that they should be doing that really aren't uh, research backed anymore. Or, you know, sometimes, they, you know, 
as you mentioned before, that the Epley maneuver, um, you know, it's the, the one that Sheila was kind of demonstrating there too, is is frequently used because it, it you know does hit home on uh, you know the one of the most frequently frequent forms of BPV. Pardon me, um, but sometimes you know people will have it in a different ear canal or they you know have it that other variant that you're referencing where it's kind of hung up and it's not going to work for that, right? So um, it's you know and lots of times these folks when they're coming in are you know telling me that you know they've undergone many treatments and many sessions and there has been no resolution and so um, as you say like the the research is showing and usually just only one to three maneuvers and that's uh, if it's performed correctly is going to be sufficient to you know kind of help out with it you know if it's a hung up variant it might take a few more um, they're a little bit more um, pesky <laughs> um, and take a bit longer at times but um, you know it really makes me cringe when we, you know, when we hear about people who've been going for treatments multiple times a week for weeks on end, and it's an, undoubtedly the maneuver has either been performed incorrectly, or it's the wrong maneuver, or it wasn't actually BPPV after all. And so, yeah, that's where, again, as you say, that assessment's key. That's great. Yeah, and a good point. Yeah, the fact that it can be resolved, like, or, you know, symptoms can be kind of addressed in one to three treatments. There's not a whole lot of things out there that you can actually do that with. So that's a really great uh, kind of statistic to share with everybody. And if it's going on for longer than that, we need to kind of take a step back and figure out what's going on here. So Manny, um, I have heard um, from many different people that they're just told to live with their vertigo or with their positional vertigo, and it'll go away on its own. Is that actually true? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question too. Um, so the answer is yes and no. <laughs> yes, because what we know from the research or from what the research tells us is that one in two people can spontaneously get their BPPV to resolve, right? The problem with that is that one in two people also can't get their BPPV to resolve, right? And in those people where it does resolve, we don't know how long that's gonna take. Right. And then while you have that BPPV, um, it can have a huge effect on your quality of life. Right. You're going to be dizzy. You're going to be very sensitive to, mo uh, to motion. You're going to feel unsteady. Um, it can actually be quite dangerous because you could also fall. Right. Um, if you're if you're um, get an episode of vertigo when you're up reaching for something, for example, um, that can be that that can cause some serious injuries. So for something that is very easily assessed, something that is very effectively treated, right? Like we just said, one to three sessions and we can probably fix your BPPV depending on what's going on. Um, the wait and see approach is probably not the best approach for everyone. That's true. And, and yeah, one in two can, but one in two can't. So yeah, you get a 50-50 chance when you just go and, and go for one or two sessions and, and get it straightened out. So thanks for sharing that too. Uh, Marina, I've also heard, and, and we probably, um, you know, we're all notoriously good at this. I mean, Google, right? Dr. Google is out there to save all of us from all of our conditions. Um, but people have been told to Google it and find instructions and treat them themselves. Is that okay? Is that something people should be doing? Uh, well, I mean, we all know that, I mean, most of us are guilty of having, you know, talked to Dr. Google at various points, but, um, you know, Google is kind of like the Wild West, uh, you know, it's difficult, there's tons of information out there, but it's hard to know whether or not that information is always credible or, you know, where it's coming from. And so, you know, you're going to find many different things. Uh, posted there and on a whole bunch of forums and sites. Um, you know, some people will get lucky and they're going to, you know, try and maneuver and it might work for them, which is great for them. Um, but that's not going to be the case for everybody. Um, you know, sometimes people actually make it a little bit worse or more difficult to treat when they come in after trying it on their own. Um, but it's other, there's other things that are important to consider. And first being that you need to know for sure if what you have is in fact BPPV. So like we talked about before, sometimes there's misconceptions, sometimes people think it is and it isn't. But the other thing we need to know is that in order to choose the right treatment maneuver or treatment um, to do, we need to know um, like which out, oops, sorry, which ear is being impacted, um, where those crystals are, are talking to the brain from, and you know uh, what canal is impacted, and whether it is that free floating or hung up variant, um, in order to you know ensure that we're doing the right treatment, right? And so um, you know only when we've done you know a reassessment and we can figure this stuff out do we actually know um, what we should be doing. And so again, that's where you know getting uh, a vestibular assessment is really the the best way to go, um, and particularly one where we can use those infrared goggles to kind of help us figure it all out. 
Yeah, so this is this is um, is actually quite interesting because this actually happened to a patient that came in um, a few weeks ago into the office, right? She was experiencing vertigo. She called her doctor. Um, the doctor diagnosed her with BPPV, told her to look at the Epley maneuver um, online. And she did that. She found it and she was doing it for a few weeks and her symptoms did not get better, right? When she came in, um, we assessed her, we figured out that her issue was in the left ear and she'd been doing the Epley maneuver that she found online, which was for the right ear for the past few weeks, every day, a few times a day to try and fix her issue. Once we figured out which ear it was in, um, it took one session with her, right? Um, we assessed her, we treated her, she came back for a follow-up, everything was clear, her vertigo was gone. Um, so the assessment is key. Really, like that is the first step in treatment. Um, the other thing to note too is if you're doing this yourself or if you're having someone else do it for you that's not particularly that knowledgeable about what's going on there, um, they can actually make things worse, right? Your head has to be at par in particular positions for a specific amount of time at particular angles. Um, and we use those positions with our knowledge, with um, what we see and what you report to us to actually make sure we're going through the, the, the maneuver properly. If you don't do it properly, then you can actually make things worse by getting the crystals to move into a canal where there weren't to begin with. Um, and some crystals in certain canals can actually be a lot more challenging to treat. So you may start off with something that's very simple if it's treated properly and end up with something very complex because you're trying to do something that you found online. Awesome. And thanks for sharing that story too, Manny. That's a, a great example of the, just right recently, it sounds like coming yeah. into your office. So I'm going to stay with you, Manny. Um, should people feel 100% after you do this treatment or after the BPPV is cleared? <clears throat> yeah. So a lot of people do feel 100%. Right. A lot of people come back and they're like, thank you. It's gone. I don't get vertigo anymore. Right. They're very, they're, these people, these patients tend to be quite appreciative. Um, and a lot of them do feel 100%. However, some people or some patients, even when the crystals are back into the correct compartment in the ear, um, they might still experience a little bit of motion sensitivity. They might still experience a little bit of kind of this feeling of being off balance. And the reason for that is that, you know, your, 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 your brain can adapt very quickly to things. And if you, if you have BPPV, your brain can adapt to having BPPV, right? Once you fix that issue, then it can also take time to readapt to not having BPPV. So some people just take a little bit longer and some people actually need, um, certain exercises that we have that we can give people to help them readapt a little bit faster. So most people do feel 100%, but some people do need a little bit more help to completely get their symptoms to resolve. Awesome, thank you. And I think I actually saw this uh, question in the Q&A as well, but Marina, can it come back? Can it, can it, is, you know, your magical treatment who fixes me in one to three visits, is my vertigo gonna come back? Yeah. That's a question I get every single time <laughs> and an understandable one too. I know when we do the maneuver, they're like, holy cow, I feel so much better, but oh my goodness, will this come back? You know, it's, you know, it could be quite a traumatizing experience when you're feeling super dizzy and you're just feeling really unwell. And I always hate to say yes. But, you know, there, it is possible for it to, to reoccur. And in fact, usually about a third of people have a recurrence at some point um, down the road. Um, it's, and people always go, well, is it going to be me or how do you know? And I say, unfortunately, there's not a way that can say that you will or you won't. Um, the one thing that we do know from the research, though, is that if the mechanism which, you know, um, kind of precipitated or caused that um, BPPV was trauma related, meaning like if you've been had a blow to the head, if you've, you know, been in a car accident, had a concussion, something like that. That, the the likelihood of recurrence is higher um but it doesn't mean it always will be um but it is it is a higher rate with that but i mean the good thing the good news is that what i often hear too from folks who i have seen after recurrence is that when they start to get just a wee hint of those symptoms coming back on it's often less scary um because they they know what's happening you know the first time it happens you're going what is happening oh my goodness and then now they're going i think it's the crystals you know i think it's bpvv and so in that situation most people i've seen in the past will you know get on the phone and you know call and you know want to book an assessment so they can get reassessed and get that treatment done sooner than later so they can start feeling better 
Awesome. And so Marina, I'm going to stay with you. And so what should people do if they think they have this or they have had it in the past and it's creeping back in? Like you said, they're starting to feel this little something and they're suspicious. Yeah, no. Um, so first, I, I always want to say that to a reminder that there's lots of different causes of dizziness. You know, I know today we're just highlighting only BPPV, but there are other things that can, uh, you know, cause dizziness. So it's, it's really important to make sure you are getting an assessment so we can confirm, yes, that's what it is. And, you know, if you have had BPPV in the past and you were successful with, you know, obtaining the treatment and it working for you, um, that's where we would just encourage you to book a reassessment so that we can, you know, put you in the goggles. We can take a look and see what we do in the test positions, um, see, you know, if in fact it's bringing on that, those eye movements and if so where and we can figure out again where those culprits are hiding which canal and we and what form and uh, we can you know perform the treatment that you need to to you know get you feeling better because it, it, it although it's um, very uncomfortable and you can feel quite unwell um, it is a really uh, a very manageable condition um, for the vast majority of cases so that's the good news if there's some of this <laughs> yeah if, if I could add to that um, like you said, I think it's important to remember that BPPV is only one of the causes of vertigo, right? Um, luckily, our assessment is quite comprehensive as well. And then we're trained throughout our assessment, both by asking you questions and with all the tests that we do, to actually screen for other things that can cause vertigo. Um, some of these things we can also help you with right? With certain exercises, um, with certain education, we can help you kind of manage whatever it is that you're dealing with. But some of these things can also be quite serious, um, where you need to go back to your family doctor or um, other treatment recommendations need to be made. Um, the benefit of being assessed by uh, someone who is knowledgeable about this area is that we can help guide you to the correct treatment, we can communicate with your family doctor to make sure that you are getting the right treatment, right? Awesome, thanks. And thanks for adding that in, Manny. You're right, it's such a, you know, it's a very comprehensive look and looking at all the various different systems that could be at, at, at play here. So, um, so Marina, uh, one question that, you know, I expect that some of our um, participants here tonight may be wondering, um, do people need to have a doctor's referral to uh, come for a vestibular assessment? Yeah, it's actually a question that we get at the clinic quite often when people are calling in and, and the answer is no. Um, so no, you do not re need re require a doctor's referral in order to get a vestibular assessment or subsequent treatments. Um, I, I know a lot of people have that misconception. So just like other forms of physiotherapy, um, it is direct access. You just need to call and book an appointment and you you can get in to be, be seen by a vestibular therapist. Um, you know, it makes me quite sad when I, I hear, or I've met many, uh, many different patients where they've been, you know, waiting for months on end to, to be seen by a specialist like an ear, nose and throat specialist doctor um, or to get an MRI um, when neither of those options are actually an appropriate course of action or treatment for BPPV. And so they, a lot of times they've waited, they've seen them and they get the referral back to us um, for the same thing they could have had earlier. And they're going, oh my goodness, why didn't I know this? You know, and so, um, you know, the other thing too is that it, I, I tell patients not to hesitate to come in because, you know, as Manny was alluding to before and was talking about that, you know, we're very aware that dizziness can be caused by other things and more serious issues. So, um, you know, when we're vestibular therapists, we've got the training to be able to do a very thorough assessment and to screen for flags of thinking something that would be indicative of more serious condition. And, and like Manny said too, um, if we do identify any of those things and we figure out it's not BPPV, um, we're definitely going to be communicating with your family physician to, to ensure that you are getting, um, you know, the appropriate referrals or um, investigations performed so that you can get the, the care that you, you need. Awesome, great, thanks so much for that, Marina. So I'm just gonna put up a quick screen share um, just before we go to some of the questions um, from the chat um, that uh, have come in today, just because I do expect kind of one of the other questions that people may be wondering is, you know, how do I, how do I get an appointment? Um, as you said, you can certainly contact a clinic. So we do encourage anyone who may be um, thinking that this might be a, a valuable service to kind of have a comprehensive assessment with one of our uh, vestibular therapists to go to uh, lifemark.ca. There's a website at the bottom here and you can go to the dizziness and balance page. Uh, and there's a link there to find a clinic near you. Um, if you would rather telephone call, you can call this 
1855 number, and that is a central intake uh, line. So they'll be able to connect you with the therapist or the clinic that's closest to you. Uh, if you'd rather email, you can also do that as well. And then we also encourage you to follow us on social media, uh, wherever you uh, do your social media-ing, is that's an activity that you do, um, because we do always share different content and ongoing information around different topics that we see in our clinics regularly, so it may be helpful for you or one of your uh, friends or family members. So I'm going to just look at the questions here. There are a couple of good ones. We'll just take a couple. Um, Sheila, I don't know if you had any particular that you wanted to do, but I see one here that I'm going to put out there. And Manny or Marina, whoever wants to take this, I think this is a good one to clarify. Can BPPV be so severe that it lasts for 12 hours with severe vomiting and nausea where you cannot stand or sit up at all? Or is this perhaps another type of vertigo? Uh, I can answer that if you want, Marina, and then you can add things to it. Um, so <laughs> there, like I said before, there are certain types of BBPV that can cause prolonged symptoms or prolonged vertigo, but 12 hours is a really, 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 really long time. Um, it's also the vomiting, the, the not being able to get out of bed. All those things sound like it's not BBPV. Um, there are certain conditions that do fit with exactly what you just described. Um, I think the, the most important thing is if you're experiencing that is you need to get assessed to make sure um, that they're screening you for other possible causes of, of, um, of vertigo or dizziness. But in short, that does not sound like BPPV. And normally if it's 12 hours, you can't get out of, you can't get it to stop by just changing your position. If we go back to that keyword positional, then we're probably not dealing with BPPV. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so this is a, another good question. I see a couple of, of questions around it. So the crystals that you've been talking about since the very beginning, um, I, I think Marina, you touched on this, but like, what are they meant for? So maybe you can just quickly review for everybody what the purpose of the crystals are. And kind of another question that's kind of related to it is, could you have crystals uh, causing your BP, BPPV, see, I have a hard time saying that, in both ears with one being more dominant. So would you take first maybe uh, what those crystals are meant for? Yeah, you bet. So again, these crystals are in kind of a chamber or a portion of your inner ear. And so they're sticking on kind of this jelly type surface. And so what they do is when they have some movement, so when we're doing kind of a, a tilt or kind of a movement of our head, or we're moving kind of forward, backwards, Oops. when we get that, you know, increase or decrease of our movement, that acceleration, deceleration, um, it's sending, it's part of a mechanism to send information to our brain saying that we are moving in that, um, in those planes. So it's helping to detect or sense head position and movement. Um, so they do have an important role. We need to have them. Um, they're, even though they're teeny tiny, they have a huge role in our ability to stay on our two feet and function. Um, and the second part of the question was, could, they be, could it be in multiple canals? Is that correct, Krista? Yeah, or in both uh, ears, or both uh, with ears, one being me. more dominant. Yeah, so it, it is possible to have the crystals in multiple canals in one ear, and it also is possible to have the crystals in um, canals in either or both ears. Um, and so lots of times um, we will find that when we're doing various tests for, you know, the there's the three different canals, we'll, we'll pick it up in one and then we'll also pick it up in another. So sometimes, um, you know, we can move the crystals from one canal, as Manny was referencing, into another. And sometimes it happens to be that we have it already when we first have the onset of symptoms that it's in both. And so um, we can't see them enough to count them to see that there's more in one ear than another, but lots of times we'll find that, you know, certain positions might just be, you might be a lot more symptomatic in one. So lots of times we'll need to treat that one maybe first, prioritize it, and then in a subsequent session or, or afterwards, we may try the other one um, to then, uh, if they're requiring different maneuvers to, to do those um, kind of consecutively. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, kind of a question, a little bit related to one of the questions we talked about already before. The question is, is it possible the treatment can make it worse? So I think we talked a little bit about, you know, doing this online um, treatment and or trying to kind of do this, you know, one particular approach might make it feel worse, but is it possible that the treatment can make the BPPV worse? Yeah, I can answer that if you like. Um, so it can happen theoretically, right? It depends. 
Um, it depends on the, like tech, theoretically, if you do the treatment properly and you get the crystals back to where they're supposed to be, and that's all that's what's, and that's all that's going on, it shouldn't make it worse, but everyone's anatomy is different, <laughs> right? Everyone has their own limitations. Everyone has their own ability to get into certain head positions. Also, like we said before, some people are self-managing this at home because they looked on Google and they found a maneuver that they've been trying on their own. Um, all those things can actually um, affect the ability of those crystals to move back into the correct part of your ear. Sometimes without, you know, without doing it intentionally, some of these crystals might end up in another canal. Um, sometimes we think that we're actually moving them. Um, but maybe there are um, maybe there's certain anatomical differences in your ear that make it a bit more challenging to actually clear them or they might get stuck somewhere. So all those things might actually make the symptoms appear worse. Um, but once you once the, the treatment itself, if we're doing it properly and if we're actually going through the ear, theoretically, like it shouldn't it shouldn't make things worse. Yeah, I, I do. I think that's one thing that's important to note, too, is that sometimes symptomatically you might feel worse versus actually the BPB itself being worse. Um, so I do um, kind of caution sometimes when people are coming in that because we need to put you in these test positions, which is, you know, if the crystals are out of place, are going to create that the onset of your symptoms. We're going to, we unfortunately need to bring on your, your vertigo symptoms in order to help diagnose and treat it. So sometimes you might feel, um, you know, a bit more nauseated and more tired um, or those types of things after you've had an assessment or treatment. Um, and so that's where, you know, we haven't made it worse, but you might feel worse for a period of time. Um, so that's where we also generally will recommend, if, if possible, if you have a family member or a friend that could maybe drive you home in case you are feeling a little bit more off, um, that's a good way to go. Um, but I mean, I've had lots of patients where I, you know, done the treatment and they're like, oh, I feel rotten, you know, but then the next day they call me like, I feel great. You know, so they thought that it was going to be so much worse after we did the treatment because they felt, you know, really kind of shook up and it's a whole lot of, you know, um, stress on your system when you're experiencing that really intense vertigo for, for some folks. But yeah, I often will get like the next day a call back saying, holy cow, did that ever improve things? And I feel great now. So, yeah. Great. All right. I'm going to just take one more because I see a couple of other themes um, here. Um, some, a bunch of people are asking about, um, can stress cause it? But then I also see people mentioning about neck and shoulder pain being related to it. So I wonder, actually, I'm going to do two more because there's a really other good question here too. So can you maybe just talk about kind of the neck and shoulder pain that might kind of go along with BPV? Would they really be related or might they not be related? Um, so I can take this one here. Um, so with BPV, as we talked about, it's the crystals that are causing it and it's based on head movement. So um, having neck or shoulder pain is not going to cause the, the crystals to come loose. Um, but if you are feeling dizzy, often a secondary kind of um, thing that can happen is if we feel really dizzy and when it's you know, come brought on by a head movement or head turns or bending, we often try to limit those things like Maddie was talking about earlier. So lots of times we get really stiff when we start doing, you know, lots of head turns like this and we just become really tight and tense in our neck, um, kind of as a, a way to protect ourselves from getting in those movements that make us feel, you know, dizzy, um, but it's not going to cause it. Um, yeah. Awesome. I forget what the other part of the question was. <laughs> stress? Yeah. Stress. Sorry. Yeah. Stress. Yeah, I know. And again, stress is not going to cause the, the crystals to come loose. But again, we often will feel stressed or we'll feel anxious or, um, you know, when we are experiencing these symptoms. Okay, great. So someone is, uh, actually a couple of people are asking about the Brant Daroff exercises. So um, someone is asking, what do you think of using the Brant Daroff exercises, um, and someone else said that they were told to do these repeated movements. So I, I think that that's probably what they're talking about there. So I don't know if anybody wants to chat a little bit about that. Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so those exercises they can they, they can help you with BPPV, right? Um, the maneuvers, the more targeted and more specific maneuvers that we use commonly to treat BPPV, um, particularly the EPLI, um, 
they have a lot more research to back them up. Um, they have a lot of research that supports how effective they can be very quickly. Um, and they're very easy to do with the help of, 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 of someone who's knowledgeable in this area. So those exercises, um, they shouldn't be your first, your go-to type of treatment for, for this issue. Um, there are much, much, much better um, maneuvers that can be much more effective at, uh, at, at treating this condition. Awesome, great. Well, thank you very much. I said there's still a ton of other questions. And I know Sheila has very, been very kind trying to answer as many as she, as she can. Um, we will review all the questions that uh, come in. So if we didn't get to your question, hang tight. Watch our lifemark.ca uh, website in our blog section particularly. We do try to use uh, key and common questions that we hear to help us develop um, more content that will help you to uh, answer those questions. So please do that and follow us on the social media channels so we can help you send send that information your way or um, definitely as I said before do try to reach out to Lifemark to schedule an appointment somebody asked about the goggles uh, the vast majority of our clinics the Lifemark clinics that offer this service vestibular rehabilitation have the unique uh, equipment that Marina was showing us earlier with the goggles um, it is one of the kind of hallmark things that we have uh, above most other clinics uh, that do this sort of work. So you definitely want to be looking for that in your area. Um, I know that uh, Manny and a couple others have done also some virtual services uh, in this area. So if you find yourself not in close proximity to a clinic of ours, that is an option as well as that you could consult with a vestibular therapist on a virtual um, uh, appointment to get some advice, ask some questions. They may ask you to do some different things to help diagnose that. Um, but you definitely want to uh, make sure that you're in a, the hands of a skilled individual um, to help you make sure that it is in fact BPV and they can help you uh, get sorted out in one to three sessions. So thank you to Manny and Marina for your time tonight, for sharing again your knowledge and expertise. I think you both did a great job helping us all understand uh, this very common uh, thing that you get a lot of questions about. I also want to thank Sheila Woodhouse in the background of uh, the session today. I know she's been managing the chat and the questions and answers as much as possible. She is our national vestibular lead and trains all of our lovely therapists. So she is definitely the expert that you saw in that video, those videos as well. So thank you to you, Sheila, as well for helping us put this together. Um, and thank you all who attended tonight. We appreciate your time, your attendance, and your interest in these topics. Uh, do watch your email. We will be sending out a survey to ask you your opinion about how the webinar went for you, what you thought about it, and if you have any other ideas of topics that you might like us to do. Um, please take a few minutes to fill that out so that we can use your feedback to help guide our next direction. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for giving your evening and your time, uh, and have a lovely rest of your evening. Take care.